What's happening? Welcome to On The One, where I break down one of my sessions, talk about the production, writing, recording, mix process of one of my tunes. Today's subject, design, featuring Kimbra. So this is a tune that I had for a while as a little voice memo, and then I was messing around on a little Instagram Live or something with Pitar playing drums and bass, and it has just had this cool little bass groove that I've been wanting to write something with. It's just this. So I had that sort of bass groove, that idea, that sort of thing in my mind, was messing around with it. Then I was on tour in February, decided, ah, let's cut a little demo of this, just to kind of get some ideas together. And then I took it home and then started working on it a little bit more, just like a couple months ago, because I had some time. And eventually I was able to get this thing to a place where I was feeling really good about it, put out a little Instagram challenge to find somebody to top line it, which is what led me to my friend, John Lampley, who crushed it. I ended up hiring him for this whole other project, this thing that I was working on that, and decided this, this feels like it's a vocal tune. One of my absolute favorite, favorite artists on the planet is Kimbra. She is so good. Artistry, creativity, mastery of just the skill and the craft of what she does. She's incredible. I've been a huge fan of hers for a long time. So I just hit her up online and said, hey, I've got this tune. I feel like you might be perfect for it. Here's a demo that I made. Are you down? She hit me back and much to my surprise, she was a fan of my music, a fan of Wolfpack. So I was really stoked about that. And she said, all right, tell you what, let's meet in LA next week. Let's write this tune together. So basically I put together a full rhythm section mock-up that would be usable if we wanted to. Didn't know if it was gonna be the finished thing or not, and the majority of it was, but the demo I sent her was this. the exact thing that I put up for my Instagram challenge thing, but there was a whole song form and I had the song form out. So she lived with it for a little while and then we kind of went back and forth on just some conceptual things. And then she sent me back a little bit of a vocal demo, just kind of making sounds to get some melodic ideas over the top, just so we could kind of start getting some creative juices flowing. So right there, I was really into the idea of kind of David Bowie, David Byrne sort of thing, a weird speak singing sort of thing for the verses, which we did end up keeping and did end up using. There was one spot that we actually, she wanted a little higher energy in the B section, which is now, I guess, the chorus, but this sort of thing, I was thinking kind of Chili Peppers 90s vibe, but she wanted more energy. This is actually where I went originally for the, the chorus. <laughs> So she said, yeah, I don't really know what to do over that spot. It doesn't feel like it's really where I want it to go. Maybe let's explore some options of ramping up the energy instead. So before I got to LA, I was thinking of some different parts and I just said to Pitar, hey, look, send me some different ideas. Give me Teen Town hi-hat with a halftime backbeat. Give me just a regular halftime backbeat thing. Give me something that's just thrashing and kind of a couple options in between. So I had a few different options there and we ended up settling on something that just felt like it lifted and soared, but not in the sense where a typical chorus would just kind of explode. It just kind of opens up and widens up. So I thought that was kind of interesting. It's a different way of doing a chorus than I would normally do it, but I love the idea. So here's what we started with when we were in the studio. And I say studio with quotes because I was just at this Airbnb in Silver Lake and it had a comfortable desk and I brought my Apollo and my laptop and 
I got some speakers and we were just chilling. I brought my couple mics. It was great. We both like working in that little lower pressure environment. It was fortified by a formula of yes, no's, and goodbyes. I... All right, so drum wise, this is what we're looking at. Yeah, I used a trigger. Here's without the trigger. Here's with it. This gave a little more life to it. And almost makes it a little more mechanical, which I like for this song. And then bass wise, what I have is just my regular bass and then I doubled it. I just copied the track down. The regular one just has the archetype Corey Wong plugin. DI funk console bass sound. And then the other one, I basically put this Uber mod on it to give it a wide feel. Here's with the Corey Wong archetype DI funk console thing. Now it's with kind of that added wide, chunky thing. Just adds some vibe to the bass. It sounds dope on its own, but I thought with this track, it was nice to have something wide that kind of cut a little bit. And then uh, I just retracked a different bass when Kimber and I wrote the, the chorus together. I used this Crusher bass preset on the Wong plugin. And it's great. Gives a lot of body, that sort of thing. And guitar wise, this is where it gets fun. There's a lot of guitars. You can see everything soloed here is guitars. I normally don't get to record this many guitars on a song because I do most of my stuff live in the studio and it's just me playing my guitar one time down. This time around, a little more fun because I got to do a bunch of layers. So I have these two main guitars that are playing the exact same part, just panned hard left and right. And then I ended up recording a bunch of guitars that function as one section. So a lot of times what I like to do when I'm crafting guitar parts is have like a guitar orchestra. And this is something that I don't get to do when I do other people's albums because I don't get to do it a lot unless the producer or the artist really trusts me. But if it's like at a session in Nashville and everybody's like, all right, come up with a guitar part. You do your thing. It's like, all right, next. It's like, well, can you give me six tracks? I have this really cool idea for this thing. Like, no. Okay, fine. But when I, when somebody allows you the time, somebody allows you the space to be able to do this, you can do something really fun like this here. That sort of thing. I just, I need stereo spread and I have different octaves that I play it in and I have different harmony parts that I play it in. But it's the sort of thing where I record one. All right, give me the next track. Okay, record that. Pan them hard left and right. All right, give me another one. Play a harmony. All right, pan it a little bit to the left. Give me another one. All right, pan that one a little to the right. And then I kind of build this guitar orchestra, which is really fun. And I did this sort of idea throughout the song. So it could be like one keyboard part, but it's a bunch of guitars and I don't mess with the time or quantize them because all the little nuances kind of make it what it is. It's really cool. Like see even on this one right here, I missed those two notes. Who cares, screw it. Like ah, this guy's a little bit rushy, whatever. Doesn't matter. It's fine, it just works on its own. And then, Later in the song, I made a solo out of all these guys. So what I did there is I basically had two different guitar orchestras. And I learned this technique from Michael Nelson, the horn arranger from the Hornheads, who did all the horn arrangements for this and does all the stuff with me. He likes to separate things into two different sections once in a while. It's not always just 
brass and saxes or whatever, but it's kind of breaking up a section into two different parts. So you have a lot more call and response and then eventually letting them weave together. It's a really fun idea. And this again, you can hear it's not quantized. I like having a little bit of a ping pong thing. You can see I also muted these parts because it just started to get really busy. The end of this song is already really busy how it is. Having these extra guitar parts in there was just way too much. So I decided, forget it. It's cool with the horns and Kimbra as the focus. This afforded me the option to be able to record, I don't know, how many tracks I have here. This is a lot of guitar tracks. This is the most guitar tracks I've ever put on a song. It's really fun, but it's just different. As far as keyboard land goes, I have Kevin G's original little Wurlitzer part that he played in. And then I have these little Oberheim things. I don't know which Oberheim, it's just some stock logic or not stock, it's something in the EXS24. I play them in differently, I pan them differently just to give them a different vibe. And then I also have this little music box. It sounds really weird. But literally all it is, is I recorded this little, I call it the synth gangster. It sounds like some gang territory synth or something. I put the micro shift on it to give it a little spread. I took that MIDI data, literally just copied into this music box patch that I found in Logic and together it's this. It kind of like half step motion, it's weird. And then this little cat, the groove clav, I use this in a lot of my tunes. It's because I like the rhythmic texture that it gives and it's different than my guitar. I feel like my rhythm guitar functions a certain way, but this clav functions in a different way. And again, it's the sort of thing where I play the thing in and it does its thing. It's got a little arpeggiator and then I just copy it over to another track, pan it differently and then it's got a vibe to it. In context, it's this. It's just fun, it adds a little bit of a different thing. It's a different bounce and a different attack that I just can't get on the guitar. And I don't know, I think as a producer, it's fun to have some little fingerprint and unique sounds that you go to that are just kind of part of your catalog of sounds you use. Like I've used this on Work It Out. I've used this on, I don't remember what other tunes off the top of my head, but I've used it quite a bit. So that stuff was pretty much all done, except for the little guitar soli at the end when Kimber and I were recording together. So we got into the studio space together, the Airbnb, and we're just trying to figure out what to do. We started with the verses. All right, let's just get in the verses. Here's the concept for this tune. There's a couple different things that we were exploring, but the one that was seemingly most magnetic at the time, at least to our creative selves in the room, was the idea of machine versus man, or like towing the line between being a machine and a person, and how we strive for that human thing. Okay, now we're gonna get down into these vocals, where look at this, look at this. This is a lot of vocal tracks. Most vocals I've ever put on a song. But in the same way that I don't like producers saying, oh no, I don't wanna add more tracks. Kimbra, every time she said, hey, can I get another track? Boom, 
copy one down, boom, copy one down, boom, next, 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 next. I just wanted to have, rifle it off, whatever creative thing she wanted to explore, I was not going to let the technical hangups of Pro Tools or me not knowing how to route something or me not knowing how to get it without latency and no plugins or whatever. I didn't want any of that. I just wanted to be able to give her complete creative freedom to just explore the things and the ideas exactly in the moment. So that's why the session looks a little messy is because I was there when we did it all. So I know how I organized it, but we started with the verses. So we just have this sort of thing. And I love the sound like her original demo. It's got this sort of weird delay thing. I just used this H delay. Sounds dope. I was fortified by a formula of yes, no's and goodbyes. I kept so defined by a wrecking ball of unsuspecting eyes. Then it autom like a hungry I automated it to turn off for that second half of the verses, especially because what we ended up doing there is we ended up doing a bunch of doubles. So that just adds a nice little thing where we've got either different high singers doubling the parts or even just doubling the parts and panning them around. It creates a kind of different thing of like, where is this singer? It's a, it can be a little bit disorienting in a good way to kind of get the message of this tune across. By a wrecking ball of unsuspecting eyes. Like a hungry lover, I've been undercover looking for a place to lie. I put on my suit and tie, no compromising, pay no mind to my real life. We recorded the verses first, and then we figured out the chorus lead vocal, which we have here. The feeling's gone, now that the feeling's gone. I want to see the world through your eyes. Ooh. Now that the feeling's gone, and now that I'm on my own again, I'm rediscovering my design. Really fun, but because it doesn't come in until a bar after the chorus starts, we wanted to have a little bit of vocal energy and a little bit of something that opened it up. So then the chorus came. That's actually, to me, the biggest challenge of this tune is the fact that the chorus doesn't just smack you right away. You gotta be patient for the chorus to hit. So we added a bunch of these extra vocals down here. Here's what we settled on for the first bar of the choruses and then the halfway point as well. It's cool, there's kind of, I wanted to create a flow where it feels like the vocal goes across and it's kind of moving. So that way you feel like you're almost swimming. It helps the thing to widen up to me. And then we had these other leads and this ooh, ooh, ooh thing that we really wanted to capture in the vocal, uh, which is what you hear with this step as well. I'm just gonna give you all the vocals so you can hear them together. And one of the things that I really like to do with vocals to give a little more intimacy in this up close thing is to do whisper tracks. I did this on my tune Light As Anything. I've done it on a bunch of other songs that I've produced. And actually, I stole this from Eminem. I saw him, I don't know what it was, some sort of production breakdown where he would rap his verse and then he would do the whole thing. He would double the track whispering and they'd pan it hard left, double it again, hard right. And it does, it just does this cool thing. So here's. The feeling's gone, now that the feeling's gone. Now I wanna see the world through your eyes. Now that the feeling's gone, now that I'm on my own. Now with this sort of thing, I really have to be diligent about lining up the consonants, especially with a whisper track where there's so much that sort of thing. So you can hear with the other lead track. I didn't want to go overboard with editing it, but you just got to make sure that it all lines up. The 
feeling's gone, now that the feeling's gone, I wanna see the world through your eyes. Ooh, now that the feeling's gone, now that I'm on my own again, I'm rediscovering my design. And especially because this isn't like we were out on tour playing this song for six months. We're literally writing and recording this song at the exact same time. Then in the post chorus, she was just kind of ad libbing some sound effects. Yeah. Mm. Just gives a little bit of energy to the track. And then at the very end, it was really fun to have her just ad lib over it, kind of hinting back at the chorus with the guitar and horn solely thing happening and the chorus kind of the idea being thrown back out. Ooh, now that the feeling's gone, now that the feeling's gone. <sighs> And that's a really fun transition right into the horn section because one of the things that Michael is really good at is overdubbing horns and taking a look at the big picture. What is everything that's going on and how can I contribute to make everything feel like the rhythm section parts that are there, how do I make it feel like they're actually getting hits of the horn parts? How can I make it feel like the singer is singing the horn line with them? Well, part of it is just writing horn lines and writing horn parts to what already exists. So he's the king of that. This Kimbra ad lib being a perfect example where we took this line that she just was riffing on the spot and then decided, all right, let's weave it within and out of the horn section line. So check this out. So he had those trumpets match her vocal thing, which is super fun. All right, now let's dive into the horns in general. This one, because it's got, the song has this dissonant man versus machine trying to figure out where and who and what you are. I like the idea that it starts with this dissonant thing and then the horns really accent that by hitting a sharp note and then pulling off. And it's, it's a cool effect. Like this. The tough part about the horns on this song was making them fit within the chorus. Sound wise, they're so big already and there's so much going on in the chorus with Kimbra's background vocals and her lead vocal. I didn't want the horns to get in the way. So one of the things that I did is I just put them through this different filter, cutting out a lot of the lows and highs, kind of giving it a little bit of a vintage speaker sort of sound. That's without it. That's with it. It kind of puts the horns in a little bit of a different space for that section of the song while the lead vocal can kind of do its thing and widen up during the choruses because that's the focus. Now the really fun part about the horns is the outro. So I'm just gonna solo horns and drums for the outro here. This is fun. That's insane, that's so fun. Here it is in context.
insane. Now, there's a handful of calling cards. I've worked with Michael Nelson so much. This sort of Barry and tenor in fifths, carrying this meaty low thing. Now trombone joining in on the low thing. Trombone isn't always in there. It's interesting that he has a trombone on this one. The top horns doing the big stabs, kind of doing an altered line, and the alto being then more part of the brass section. So what you have happening here is the alto now is kind of part of the brass section, and then the bone is more a part of the sax section, which is pretty fun. It kind of reverses their roles, and it creates a different sound, and it allows things to be able to stair step up in a different way, which is super fun. That's crazy. That's crazy. The fun thing about it is my absolute number one pick for this tune, favorite person that I thought would be perfect for it was Kimbra. And it's incredible. It's the power of the internet right there. I just sent her a message kind of nervously, like, uh, what's she gonna think? And she said, love the tune. And that is so cool. And you never know who is already familiar with your music and who's already a fan of you or your band. And that was really fun because she is, like I said, one of my absolute favorite artists in the world. And it was really fun to work with her on this track. She is brilliant. And if you are not familiar with her music, go check it out right now. Don't even listen to this. Go check out her music. Cause it's honestly, it's like what I put on when I want to listen to music when I'm hanging out. So anyways, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Peace.